Nice little game of hide and seek. I love that. But I'll find you, I'm a year and a half ago. Been a long time since we saw each other. Must be what? Since the last review? I hate it when you abbreviate my name like that! Well, it's not so much a name as it is a designation. It does serve its purpose well for portraying exactly what I am to you, doesn't it? So, morbid curiosity then? I know, it's good, isn't it? What happened to you? You were supposed to be gone for good! <laughs> yes, you thought that, didn't you? Back when you were so busy throwing out all your crappy games and vowing to stay away from them for good, effectively sealing me away. But that was until you discovered Internet Reviewers, that guy with the glasses, the angry video game nerd, the spoony one. And you foolishly wanted in on all that. But in a humorous bit of irony, you found that all your material for reviewing was lost for good. So your interest in low-quality entertainment was rekindled as you started scouring through material you normally wouldn't even consider. As a result, I saw the perfect opportunity to pop out of that crazy little head of yours. So that's what it was. And now that you're out again, what do you intend to do? Why, it's quite simple. This time, I'm here to stay. But to do that, I need to be in total control. I've only managed to grasp control of your mind for a brief periods so far. But once I manage to break you with enough bile to review, you'll be out of my hair for good. And then I can unleash my reviewing talent upon the unsuspecting masses of the internet. All shall love me and despair. You do realize I can't let you do that. If you want to take me on, that's fine, but leave my fans out of this. <laughs> You can't win. I've already set my plan in motion and made the necessary preparations for you. I'll be with you shortly. Crap! Going somewhere? <laughs> Finally meet face to face once again. You know, I never really got what the deal is with that eye patch. I never mind dressing in black and growing a beard, but are you really that stereotypical of Ellen? Well, yes, but it also has a symbolic meaning. I have no depth perception when it comes to quality. Get it? Huh. It actually makes a lot of sense. But let's cut the chatter short. <clears throat> You will play and review Doctor Who Destiny of the Doctors. I will play and review Doctor Who Destiny. Wait a minute, this is just like the Jedi Mind Trick. This is not like the Jedi Mind Trick. This is not like the Jedi... Wait a minute, this is just like that scene in Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. This is not like that scene in Justice League Crisis on Two Earths. Yes it is. No it isn't. It is. It isn't. It is. It is. It's not. You don't want to play and review Doctor Who Destiny of the Doctors. Oh, don't I? You just watch, mister. <laughs> Who needs the Jedi mind trick when you've got the power of reverse psychology on your side? But, wait a second. What? If I am going to do this, will you at least let me explain to the folks at home what Doctor Who is? Some of them might have never heard of it, you know. Oh, fine. Just don't take too long. Making its debut in 1963 to an unsuspecting British audience, Doctor Who is the single longest running sci-fi TV series of all time. It follows a highly eccentric and infinitely wise alien, Time Lord, known only as The Doctor who zips through time and space in his rickety TARDIS, time and relative dimensions in space, disguised as the British police telephone box, which, despite looking awfully cramped, is actually bigger on the inside. 
containing a multitude of rooms and corridors. Together with several companions he picks up during his travels, the Doctor goes on wild adventures on Earth or alien worlds in past, present and future times, fighting monsters, foiling villainous plots, righting wrongs and being generally sort of marvelous. Sure, the special effects were hokey, the story didn't always make sense, and the debate still rages on whether the 80s were the worst thing that ever happened to the show, but at its heart, Doctor Who was replete with imagination, suspense, and above all else, fun. Right from the start, it became an icon of British TV, particularly thanks to its eerie theme song, and especially following the introduction of the Doctor's most popular and enduring arch-nemeses, the Daleks. Mutant blobs genetically engineered to only feel hate for all other life forms, clad in tank-like battle armor and seeking to exterminate every species in existence to become the dominant power of the universe. The tin-plated pepper pot sparked a massive Dalek mania, spawning toys, movies, and even... novelty songs. The original series of Doctor Who ran until 1989, spawning no less than 155 multi-part serials and featured seven different actors in the lead role, thanks to the ingenious plot device known as Regeneration that let the Doctor change his appearance and personality traits upon suffering a mortal injury, thus practically allowing the show to last forever. Following an unsuccessful attempt to revive the show in 1996 with the 8th Doctor, played by Paul McGann, the show was finally successfully resurrected in 2005 and is still going to this day, with Matt Smith having stepped into the role as the 11th Doctor only recently. Of course, with a franchise of this success and popularity, it's only natural that it got oodles of merchandising, including several video games. Most of them, like the show itself, were before my time. But in 1996, I caught a glimpse of Destiny of the Doctors, a PC game made by Studio Fish. Now, since at the time I was largely unfamiliar with the show, I gave it a miss. That and the fact that it looked positively underwhelming. So, 14 years later, and here I am, with my own morbid curiosity forcing me to play and review it. Funny how these things go sometimes. Are you quite finished? You're not trying to stall the inevitable, are you? Actually, yes. You're going to make me play a game based on one of my favorite franchises ever. There's no way I'll get through this unscathed. That's the idea. Combining your love for the show with the fact that licensed games rarely, if ever, amount to anything should very well produce a mental breakdown of such magnitude that your mind will shatter like an imitation Ming vase. And then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spare me your fill in the schlock. Don't interrupt me when I'm eulogizing. Whatever. Shall we get this thing over with? By all means. As we start the game, we begin with an intro movie, featuring the late Anthony Ainley reprising his role as the Doctor's archenemy and rival Time Lord, The Master, in his final role before his death in 2004, thus joining the ranks of both Orson Welles and Burgess Meredith as actors who went out with a whimper. The Master is monologuing to nobody in particular about how he has taken control of a planet of pure mental energy, and as a result, has basically become a god of time and space, and using these powers, he's going to, you guessed it, take over the universe. Of course, Doctor. First and foremost, however, the Master uses his newfound powers to get the seven incarnations of the Doctor out of his goatee, remember this came out before the 8th Doctor movie, by imprisoning them within the Determinant, the mental realm the Master has created, and plans to erase them from history altogether. And here's where I immediately find the first major fault of the game. The Doctor, the one character this entire franchise revolves around, is barely even in his own game. How do you do that? It's like the fucking X-Files game all over again. Hell, this goes beyond even that and starts approaching the level of Bloodwing's pumpkin edge revenge. But if you think I'm exaggerating, trust me, we're only just getting started. Fortunately, some small hope of the Doctor's salvation remains, in the form of... Someone to defend your miserable existence, Doctor? Something you've cobbled up yourself by the look of it? Well, good luck, Grok. You'll definitely need it. <laughs> Grok? Who or what the fuck is a Grok? What in the hell is that? It looks like the unholy offspring of Hugh Bliss and Bob. This is the best player character they could come up with? They couldn't even bring in any of the Doctor's familiar companions? Sarah Jane? Jamie? Ace? Hell, I'd have even settled for K-9, but no. Instead we get shafted with some ageless, featureless, gender-neutral, culturally ambiguous adventure... thing. Afghan Cod for short. And what the hell kind of a name is Grok anyway? It sounds like the death rattle of someone's mother-in-law. Probably the game's designer. 
The Master, of course, being a fair sport, and a complete idiot, allows Gronk to partake in a little game of his with the Doctor's lives hanging in the balance. Why? Why would someone of the Master's intelligence allow even the slightest chance of something interfering with his plans? Seems like he's been giving that old villain ball a good squeeze. You know, when a villain does something so stereotypically villainous that it leads to his downfall? That's the villain ball. The destiny of the Doctors is in your hands. <laughs> Title drop! <laughs> ah! Run! It's the Cybernet Space Cube! I cast you out! The power of Prime compels you! The power of Prime compels you! So wait a minute. If a cube has six sides and there are seven doctors, how do they all fit in there? Well, let's not dwell on that. We'll forget about that soon enough once we get to the actual game. So, the actual game begins and you find yourself within the TARDIS console room. While normally this should lead to a geek out moment, you'll soon realize that this merely serves as a main hub from which you select one of the seven doctors to rescue. For the moment though, let's take a quick walk through the hallways. And it's here that we determine that Grok apparently turns like he's had too many banana daiquiris. Not to mention that every single movement you make produces this noise like a 51st century victrola playing a scratched record. Hmm, that's a strangely appropriate description actually. On top of that, some of the design decisions just make me want to shake my head. All of Grok's movements, as well as cycling through your inventory, though how an amorphous blob carries around objects is beyond me, and using items is done with the keyboard, but manipulating the environment and picking up objects is done entirely with the mouse. And since you need both hands to operate the keyboard, every time you need to push a button or collect something, you have to stop moving, take hold of the mouse, click on whatever you need to click on, and then go on your merry way. This is just needlessly convoluted. Why couldn't it be like in other games where you simply have a use key on the keyboard and pick up items by walking over them? Well anyways, it's not long before the fourth doctor gives us some directions, telling us to go to the third doctor's area to pick up a radio. I seem to remember having pulled a transistor radio to pieces years ago. My third incarnation was always fiddling with bits and pieces like that. It's probably in his, well, my laboratory. Could be useful. Wait, what? Tom Baker? The man notorious for never returning the Doctor Who after his tenure signed up to do voiceovers in this piece of crap? Good God, Tom! What were you thinking? This is beneath you, and you were in dimensions in time, for God's sake! In fact, all of the surviving actors return to voice their respective Doctors, while the first two, what with their actors having passed away, are voiced by reasonably decent impersonators, and the third Doctor, having passed away right before the game was made, simply has some snippets of audio from the TV series assigned to him. But since all of the Doctor's dialogue is purely expository or just utterly forgettable, not to mention repeated ad nauseum, by the end of it you'll never want to hear any of them ever again. Beware, the Master has placed traps everywhere. So we set the TARDIS for the third Doctor... I said we set the TARDIS for the third... D Ugh. I don't know if it's because my computer is too fast for this game or if it was always this crappy, but if I touch the button even slightly it shoots right past the next few Doctors. Well, eventually I managed to target John Pertwee and hit the big green button. I'm the right big threatening button which must not be pressed under any circumstances, am I right? Oh Dave, how right you are. After arriving, we soon encounter our first enemies, the Autons, those living shop window dummies with guns hidden in their hands. And it's here we learn that the enemies in this game are a complete and utter joke, even if you have no means of defense, as they slowly wobble about while you zoom right past them, and the projectiles are so immensely slow that they're no threat whatsoever unless you happen to be at point-blank range. Not to mention the difference between enemies is purely aesthetic. No matter if you're fighting Cybermen, Daleks, and Tarans, or Quarks, every single enemy behaves in the exact same manner, constantly spouting off the same three or four lines or making the same noises, driving you to insanity. And just look at the graphics and animation. Seriously, this is from 1996, the same year to Quake, at the time the benchmark of Polygon graphics was released. This is just laughable in comparison. The enemies just wobble about and move their extremities like action figures. Of course, the Daleks, being Daleks, don't suffer from these limitations, but they're equally as ineffectual as every other enemy, plus their choice of dialogue is just questionable. Why didn't they just go with the old favorite EXTERMINATE? 
Speaking of which though, many of the original sound effects from the show are used throughout the game, but that's a small comfort. And there's no music to be found anywhere either, except during cutscenes or in later sections, and given the quality of that, I guess we should count ourselves very fortunate. But more on that later. Anyways, we soon find the radio with which we can contact the Doctor's longtime ally, Brigadier Alastair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart of the United Nations, sorry, Unified Intelligence Task Force, UNIT, who gives you what I guess should be friendly advice on how to take out enemies, but most of it is either completely useless or so bleeding obvious that you don't need his help to figure it out, just totally wasting Nicholas Courtney's adequate performance. In a tight corner, you can always avoid a Dalek by blocking its vision. Try hiding behind the sofa can find one. The radio is also supposed to double as a weapon against the Autons, but I only ever managed to trigger it once and after that it totally stops working. Instead I just keep getting the Brigadier on the line. Don't take any nonsense from these monsters, Clark. If the game gets rough, shoot them down or blow them up. It always worked for me. So following Tom's advice and getting the radio turned out to be... Other enemies all require specific weapons of their own to exploit their weaknesses and take them out, but you might as well not bother with them, as each single enemy requires a ridiculous amount of ammo to take out, and taking care of just one means draining your weapon about halfway. If all else fails, you can always use the Dr. Sonic screwdriver to stun an enemy, even if those enemies should normally not be affected by it, but this is equally pointless since, again, it takes four fucking ever for one to stop moving, and the effects last less than a full minute, and on top of that, using items drains your energy! Yeah, your energy is another thing that grinds my gears about this game. While you're aimlessly wandering around the TARDIS corridors, your energy is constantly slowly ticking away. You start out with 9,999 points, which you think should be enough to last the game, and at first you'd be right. Enemies take until the end of time and longer to kill you even if you were to just stand in place and perform Hamlet in front of them. Plus, hidden in some places, you'll find blue power rods that restore part of your energy and are easily detected thanks to the constant humming noise they make. However, you'll find that the game fucking cheats and tries to steal away energy from you in several subtle ways. Getting near enemies drains energy. Using items drains energy. Jumping drains energy. Going through a random portal drains energy. The most egregious... All TV tropers in the audience take a shot. ...example of this are these bizarre traps that you have no way of knowing where they are, rapidly drain your energy and are virtually impossible to pass even if you do know they're there. Plus, the further you progress throughout the game, the faster your energy starts leaking away, to the point where you're desperately scrounging up every single power rod you can get your hands on to stay alive, because every next energy drain could very well be your last. Anyways, with the whole radio debacle out of the way, the question is, what do I do next? I can keep running around and dodging autons all I like, but it's not getting me any closer to finishing this damn game. Turns out that sometimes, doors lead to wholly different places depending on which side you go through them. A door that leads into the console room may very well lead to a wholly different corridor than the one you came from if you step into it from the other side. And while I admit that this does fit the overall theme of the TARDIS being dimensionally transcendental, that's a fancy way of saying big around the inside, it's just fucking busy work since you need to check every single door on both sides just to see if it might lead to somewhere important. Eventually, however, you find that one door doesn't lead to yet another bland corridor, but instead to this place. The Great Divide, the bridge that, well, bridges the gap between the TARDIS and the Determinant. Upon entering, the Master presents Grok with a choice of symbols, each representing a different challenge you'll have to complete in order to be led into the Determinant. Of course, at first you have no idea what each symbol does, or what the hell the Master's riddles mean, but through painstaking trial and error, I eventually managed to figure it out on my own. Each symbol boots you back into a different section of the TARDIS corridors, with the exception of this one, which simply lets you immediately enter the Determinant at the cost of a significant amount of energy, and given how much you'll be struggling to keep your energy up the further you get into the game, I don't recommend this. This symbol requires you to hunt down a certain item hidden in the TARDIS, such as the Blue Crystal of Metabolus 3, a Cybermat, or Excalibur. Yes, Excalibur. Why you would just give that to the Master instead of stabbing him in the throat with it is beyond me, but there you have it. There's no clever puzzles to solve or significant obstacles to overcome either. All you do is run around and search every nook and cranny of the TARDIS till you found what you need. With the sole exception of incidents like these where you water some plants to find a blue crystal, not that that makes much sense, or this one where you lure a yeti underneath an electromagnet to get at its control sphere, but that's the limit of how challenging this segment gets. Why do you chase me, mechanical yeti? Why? Then there are more trivial-oriented challenges such as this one. 
Strewn about the TARDIS are information terminals where you can brush up on your knowledge of monsters and aliens, which is crucial to solve the Master's riddles, since when you return to the Great Divide you'll be presented with something like this, where you'll have to identify sounds or images related to Autons by hopping on the correct stepping stones. But getting even a single answer wrong means you lose a huge chunk of energy, often with fatal results, so only hardcore Doctor Who trivia buffs need apply. This one I could never figure out. In order to cross the divide, you're supposed to step on the correct blocks based on the information terminal you find in the TARDIS, but which ones are good or bad I could never determine, so I always just gave this a miss as well. That's two parts of the game that I already don't give a crap about. Playing this game is already making me feel like I'm having my head sucked off by a Dalek's plunger arm. And I don't need my head up here! <laughs> I wonder what that would be like. Yeah, I'm sure you do, you sicko. By the way, did I mention how several sections of the TARDIS are lazily copied at verbatim? Yeah, that's brilliant level design right there. What, did Bungie hire some of the idiots that were on the team for this game when they made Halo? Plus, what the hell are these castle-like sections supposed to be? Is this the Master's TARDIS or something? The Dalek and Cyberman ships I can kinda understand, since the Master probably brought them there. And I may not be the foremost Doctor Who expert on the planet, but this just goes totally unexplained. Finally, you also have this particular challenge, where you are presented with three images of the Doctor and have to ask them questions in order to determine which one's the real McCoy, or rather Hartnell in this case. Your granddaughter accompanied you for a while. While on Earth, she adopted a surname. What was it? Ah! What the hell is that? Is that Grok's voice? He sounds like Eeyore's retarded half-cousin on a Valium binge! Though I gotta admit, they did a great job impersonating Hartnell's voice. Even if his involvement in this POS is like to have poor William doing somersaults in his grave. So by now you're probably wondering what awaits you when you do finally finish a challenge and make it into the determinant. You really wanna know what? PAIN AND SUFFERING! Once you enter the Determinant, the Master will then present you with a specific challenge for the Doctor you are trying to rescue. For the first Doctor, you are put into a maze created by the Celestial Toymaker, where you have to navigate past blinking laser beams, quarks, giant deadly rocking horses, and pitfalls. To defend yourself, you can also collect a water pistol, which apparently is quite effective against quarks. You fought her off with a water pistol! I bloody love you! But I guarantee those goddamn pitfalls are going to get you killed more times than Captain Jack Harkness on an average episode of Torchwood. They're invisible until you're pretty much right on top of one, and by that time you'll probably stumble into it before you even know what hit you. And get this, if you die in the determinant, it's game over just like that. Do not pass go, do not collect 200 Altarian dollars. Just reload your previous saved game and try again. Which brings me to my next point, the saving system. You can only ever save at specific points during the game, namely after using the TARDIS console to choose a doctor, or after visiting the Great Divide. The area you appear in afterward will always contain a time winder that lets you save the game when you run into it. However, this means that if you die in the determinant, you'll inevitably have to try again from a point before you finish your chore for the Master, meaning you have to do it all over again. And after several failed attempts at beating the determinant, that gets really old really, really fast. Anyway, about a dozen tries later, you'll have finally crossed the maze and found the side of the cube in which Hartmel was trapped, and after some encouraging words from the Master... I'm still toying with you, Grok. You amuse me, but be warned. The second I tire of you... ...will be your last. Now go. You return to the TARDIS, pick your next Doctor, and repeat everything you've done up until now to get into the Determinant. I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. That's all there is to this game. Frustration and repetition. You pick a Doctor, get to the Great Divide, collect an item or clue, get back to the Great Divide, enter the Determinant, finish the challenge, rescue the Doctor, rinse, repeat. And 90% of that is spent running up and down corridors and avoiding enemies. Seriously, there's an outrageous amount of running involved. And the other 10% is pulling your hair out over the rest of the game. As I said, Grok controls terribly, and the fact that the game's 3D engine is more primitive than what a chimpanzee using Game Maker would produce doesn't help matters either. 
Grok can jump, or more like float towards the ceiling, but you'll still get hung up on enemies doing so. Not to mention you constantly get hung up on walls, or even worse, in some cases you just get hopelessly stuck, and the only way to get out of it is to reload a saved game. Now I know why they named it Grok, since that's what the sole person playtesting this must have been shrieking constantly. And throughout all of this, I question what connection any of this has to the original source material. You could just as easily have released this game without the Doctor Who name attached to it. Aside from the involvement of all the familiar characters, monsters, aliens and the like, the gameplay does nothing to remind you of anything from the show, except maybe the endless running up and down corridors. Personally, I think a much better idea for a Doctor Who game would have been a 2D adventure game in the same vein as Monkey Island. But given the current state of the adventure game genre, and the fact that the last Doctor Who game released was a fucking Top Trump's card game, it's highly unlikely that we'll ever see anything like that happening. But alas, we're not done yet. We still have six more challenges to get through. For Patrick Troughton's second Doctor, or as we in fandom like to call him, The Mighty Trout, you get to race the Master on train tracks while Yeti shoot at you, all of which is obviously inspired by the serial The Web of Fear. The goal is to overtake the Master's train and force him to a stop by getting right in front of him, but this is of course easier said than done. The controls are extremely basic, as you can only speed up, slow down and change tracks. However, there's basically no way to avoid the Yeti's fire, meaning you are constantly taking damage. Plus, the Master's train constantly goes at the same speed and knows exactly where every obstacle is, while you're clumsily bumping into every barrier and lose valuable time and energy. On top of that, even if you do somehow manage to overtake him, oftentimes he'll just sneakily hop to the other track and leave you in his dust. And as a final insult, there's this section where you have absolutely no control over anything and just take an excessive amount of damage from every yeti floating about until you somehow manage to steer your train into a tunnel. Enough said. To rescue John Pertwee's third doctor, you face off with the master in a dogfight. Seated in your craft, you have to shoot down the master who's piloting a Dalek ship. This particular challenge is actually ridiculously easy compared to the other ones. All you do is find the master's ship and zap it several times from behind, wham bam, thank you ma'am. Now to this day I have never seen anything from the third Doctor's era of the show. Heresy, I know. But I have my doubts that there was ever anything like this in there. The fourth Doctor's challenge is a romp through his brain, and by now the designers are seriously getting lazy as it's a direct copy of the first Doctor's challenge. Great. Aside from most of the threats that were in that one, including the aggravating pitfalls, you'd also face giant swelling pods, giant jelly babies, and a two-dimensional Rastan warrior robot that's part of the wall for some reason. Why is that even here? The Rastan robot only ever appeared in The Five Doctors, a story which Tom Baker was notoriously absent from, to the point that promotional photos of the cast had to resort to borrowing a wax model from Madame Tussauds. All the while, you're bombarded with the most annoying noises known to man, as well as slightly nightmare fuelish images of the master projected on the walls, until once again you reach the goal. Next one, please. The challenge to save fifth Dr. Peter Davison has you jousting against a Centauran warrior on hoverbikes. Sounds like a recipe for awesomeness, right? But you are so wrong! Yes, thanks, Lucifer. As with the last one, your auditory canals and sanity are constantly assaulted with a constant repetition of the most insipid and repetitive medieval jingle that would be shunned at a Ren fair. And that's not even half of it. The controls are so damn slippery that you're constantly sliding off into the barrier surrounding the arena, and that costs energy. You can strafe, but only, and only, if you're moving forwards at the same time. Plus, all the time the Centauran is happily bumping into you, sending you hurtling off wherever, and doing damage to you with his lance. And when you do finally try to fight him, you'll find a frontal attack is totally useless since you only risk getting yourself stabbed that way, or bouncing backwards into the spikes. Attacking from the side or from behind is your best bet, but since your opponent constantly turns to face you, as befits a Centauran, it's very hard to sneak up on him like that. And again, I ask, where's the connection with the Fifth Doctor? The Centaurus never appeared even once during his tenure. But eventually, you'll manage to bump into Mr. Potato Head often enough and win, leading to the Fifth Doctor's salvation. Yes! 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 Then we come to the Sixth Doctor's challenge, a romp through an icy cavern. Right off the bat, you'll notice that you can barely see where you're going, as the entire cave appears to be sphere-shaped, yet instead of looking straight ahead, you're stuck constantly staring down at the goddamn floor. The goal is to get at the piece of the cube containing Colin Baker, which is protected by a force field. 
to get rid of it, you need to collect six of these things, which are guarded by what are supposed to be the Ice Warriors, indicating that any semblance of having each challenge be related to the corresponding Doctor was abandoned long ago. To find the stars, you have to rely on a sonar that beeps faster depending on how close you get to one, but the noise really gets to you very quickly. Your senses are again assaulted by a constant barrage of an endlessly looping techno beat and bright flashes every few seconds, and the controls don't help matters either. Turning and moving forwards is easy enough, but you constantly have to adjust your altitude as well if you want to get at those stars. But you have to be so damn precise, you'll often overshoot your mark. And if you try to move backwards, don't bother since you'll go slower than a snail trying to escape from a jar of KY jelly. Oh, and of course, if you were to accidentally bump into that nasty force field, you'll die instantly and start over. But slog through it and eventually you'll get all six stars and then free the doctor. Last, but most certainly not least in terms of frustration, is the seventh Doctor's Challenge, which is the carbon copy of the second Doctor's stage. Except now you race against the Master, who's riding a ridiculous little three-wheeler, while you're behind the wheel of the Doctor's beloved vintage roaster Betsy. Or so the Master claims, since you never get to see the alleged car. For once, this does have some relation to this particular Doctor, since old Sly McCoy did use Bessie once during the serial Battlefield, but if that's the case, and I realize by now I'm sounding like a broken record, what the hell are the Autons doing here? There's not much else I can say about this stage, it's exactly the same as the train car chase, but I must at least mention one, and just one, positive aspect of this stage. This little in-joke here, where you drive through a gravel quarry. You know, those places they always shot the scene set on alien planets at. Oh look! Rocks. But of course, it's far from being any sort of redeemable quality as far as this game's concerned. So once you finally beat the Master's game and free the Seven Doctors, you'd think the game would be over, right? But you are so wrong! Sadly, he's right. After finishing all seven challenges, the Master basically laughs at your futile efforts and says he let you win. You've accomplished nothing, the Doctors are still trapped, and on top of that, the TARDIS is now set to self-destruct. So basically what you're telling me is that all the effort I've put into this miserable game was... Crack! As the endgame begins, you're dumped into the watery catacombs in the lower levels of the TARDIS and left to contemplate your fate while the cloister bell reminds you of your impending doom. Of course, the first thing you'll notice is that there's no time winder to be found anywhere, so if you screw this up, you'll have to try again all the way back before the last determinant challenge you played. So how do you get out of this pickle? Well, you can swim through the tunnels for forever and a day, but with a bit of luck you'll stumble upon... this thing, where you then step inside and somehow free the seven doctors. This process, however, does drain your energy, and if you don't have enough left, you'll end up getting yourself killed this way right before the ending. Dick move, guys. Though, honestly, I hope that this means Brock sacrifices himself to save the Doctors and will never have to bother with him again. Through a montage of all seven Doctors opening title sequences from the TV show, they apparently then are restored back to normal, and the Master is somehow left powerless and trapped in a box because of this. Release me! And that's it! That's the whole ending! What a waste of my fucking time! So to sum this game up, the plot is non-existent, it's poorly designed, it's frustrating, it's repetitive, it's nothing to look at, and on top of that, it's a waste of several good actors. And if you think that this is gonna be enough to break me, you've got another thing coming. I eat bad games like these for breakfast, with milk and sugar, lots of sugar! Oh really? To me, it looks like all you need is just one little nudge and you'll be lost in the abyss forever. Get back, you! I made you and I can just as easily destroy you. Well, what are you going to do with that... 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 toy? For your information, this here is a sonic screwdriver. And to answer your question, I'm gonna reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. What in the hell does that mean? It means I'll erase you from existence! <laughs> And now you're mine! Damn, guess I'm down to my last resort. <laughs> you're seriously going to kill yourself to rid yourself of me? Take me out like Tyler Durden? Whoever said anything about committing suicide? Take a closer look, asshole. This here ain't no ordinary handgun. Oh, crap! We're so...
Barcelona! Foul of the Gecko! I'm not foul, and foul are not I. Oh, he kicks some ass! <laughs> And you know what the funny thing is? I've never even played Persona. I don't even like RPGs most of the time. You know what happens now. No! Stay away! You know what I'm gonna say. Stop it! I forgive you. Wait, what? Hell yeah! You just helped me make what should probably be my best review yet! Hey, you know, you're not so bad to have around after all, you know? Tell you what, if you keep bringing me good stuff to review and don't try to go all Grand Theft Me anymore, you get to stay. Capiche? Well, I'm not making any promises, but... In that case, I have your next review all lined up. What, you do? <laughs> my, my, you have been a busy buddy, haven't you? So, what am I reviewing? Oh, simple. It's... You've incurred my wrath. Ah!